welcome to Holy Trinity Church in Headington Quarry. We're known as the village church in the city and we have a unique location here surrounded by woodland and wildlife and yet such a close distance to the city of Oxford. We welcome many visitors to our church each year who find peace and sanctuary in this place and who also wish to visit the church where the author C.S. Lewis worshipped for many years and is buried in the churchyard. We've put together this virtual tour of our building and grounds to give you a virtual experience of visiting the building and to help guide your way through when you do visit. And so please follow me through the porch and don't be afraid to make an entrance by turning the door handle loudly as you arrive. This is what Lewis himself liked to do on a Sunday morning. Holy Trinity Church was designed in 1848 by Sir George Gilbert Scott, a distinguished architect who'd already designed the Martyrs Memorial in Oxford and was soon to design the chapel for Exeter College. It is the only parish church in Oxford of which he is the architect. Scott was a pioneer of the Gothic Revival and designed the church in the decorated Gothic style of the 14th century, which makes it appear much older than it really is. The church was built with local stone and was dedicated by the Bishop of Oxford, Samuel Wilberforce, on November the 22nd, 1849. The design of the church is simple and proportionate for a building of its size, with many core features you would expect. A font, pulpit, lectern, bell ropes, and stained glass windows that have been installed over the years since the church's founding. The nave includes pew seating and a north aisle. The chancel holds wooden choir stalls and an organ designed by Sir Kenneth Tickell. The Lady Chapel was dedicated in 1993 in memory of Canon Ronald Head, who was Vicar of Holy Trinity from 1956 to 1990 and a good friend of C.S. Lewis and his brother Warren. As you come into the church, if you look to the left, you will notice a stained glass window in the south aisle behind the font with the Latin inscription, Ecce Agnus Dei, Behold, the Lamb of God. These words are spoken by the Holy Spirit, symbolised by a dove, who pours rays of light around the Virgin and Child and into the font at the bottom of the window, which mirrors the shape and design of the stone font that lies below it. The window was given by Charles Johnston, who was Holy Trinity's vicar from 1891 to 1916, in memory of his wife. It's easy to miss it, tucked away in the south corner, but it is well worth pausing to view it and reflect on the beautiful imagery and colour. Moving into the nave of the church, you'll be interested to see the pew where Lewis himself sat. Many visitors are surprised to find it nestled away in the north aisle and close to a pillar. Lewis and his brother liked to be out of the view of others in the congregation. They did not come to church for small talk, or to socialise. They preferred the local pubs for this. Lewis also had a good view of the pulpit from here and would listen intently to the sermon at times and at other times would let his creative mind wander. One Sunday, sitting here, Lewis switched off from the sermon and dreamt up the concept and outline for his famous book, The Screwtape Letters, a timeless classic on the spiritual conflicts that are part of religious life and experience. Lewis was in great demand as a preacher and would often be invited to speak at local churches around Oxford. The congregation at Holy Trinity were fortunate to hear him preach from this pulpit on two or three occasions, 
including on the topic of miracles, which is the theme of another of his books. To the left of Lewis's pew, from the north aisle of the church, you can see Holy Trinity's most recently installed stained-glass window, the Narnia window. It depicts the Garden of Eden, as Lewis described it, a landscape of talking animals, speaking trees, courage and kindness shot through with light. Above, the lantern in the trefoil, like the holy dove in the baptistry window, sheds peace on what happens below. The window was created in 1991 through a bequest to remember two local children, William and Gillian Howe, who had died very young four decades earlier. It was designed by Sally Scott, artist and sculptural glass engraver, and includes a level of detail that is unusual for a church window because most are located at great height. The Narnia window, remembering the young audience of Lewis's books, is a perfect height for children to come and notice its many details. Focus on the gleaming glass and you see wonders. Aslan, great lion and creator, from whose mane streams light. Two boys seated on a flying horse. A small girl flying on a talking owl, all of which are Lewis's examples of courage, loyalty and endurance. And the castle Care Paravel, which became the seat of good government on earth. Below are the heads of Unicorn, Bearded Dwarf and Antlered Stag, Mouse and Small Bird. No creature too odd or too small not to be filled with God's grace, and all have roles in the Lewis stories. Along the bottom are the magic gifts made to the children by Aslan, a bottle of healing elixir, a sword and shield, bow and arrow, and the horn that summons divine help. Moving into the chancel area, you will notice our small but beautifully designed organ, which was built by Sir Kenneth Tickell and installed in 1992. It is most suited to Baroque music because it has no swell pedal or brassy stops. Perhaps Lewis would approve of this more restrained sound. He wasn't a fan of organ music. He once described it as a sort of incessant roaring. But for those who are curious to hear the sound of our organ, here's an extract from Bach's Prelude in B minor, played by our current director of music, Rosie Twether. In the early spring, light floods straight through the face of the risen Christ in the east window during the morning service. The window depicts Christ in glory and was installed in 1952 to commemorate the men of the parish who died in the Second World War. It was designed by the distinguished church architect Sir John Ninian Comper, also a leader in the Gothic Revival movement. The colour is vivid and rich with rays of sunshine encasing the seated figure of Christ with arms open in blessing. As we remember those who died in the Second World War, commemorated by this window, 
we might also take a moment to reflect on Lewis's wartime talks broadcast through the BBC Home Service, which were later published as the book Mere Christianity. They provided support and comfort to many during a time of great crisis. Here's an extract from one of his talks, used with permission from the BBC. I was pointing out last time that the Christian life is simply a process of having your natural self changed into a Christ self, and that this process goes on very far inside. One's most private wishes, One's point of view are the things that have to be changed. Out of ourselves and into Christ, we must go. Many people who visit the church with an interest in C.S. Lewis also make a trip over to Risinghurst to visit the Kilns, which was Lewis's home from 1930 to 1963 and is a 10-minute walk from Holy Trinity. The next part of this video tour takes place there. The C.S. Lewis Nature Reserve, just behind the kilns, is also well worth a visit as it provided much of the inspiration for the scenery in Narnia. The kilns, the house behind me, was built in 1922 and purchased by C.S. Lewis and his older brother Warren in 1930. C.S. Lewis then dying in 1963 and his older brother continued to own this house until 1973. It's named the kilns because before the house was built, this property was used for the purpose of making bricks and two very large uh, brick kiln structures were just over there. Uh, they were used for making bricks until around the 1920s and the farmhouse was built and it was turned into a residential property. C.S. Lewis loved the country, he loved nature. He wasn't very happy living in town. So when they purchased this place originally, there were nine acres surrounding the house, including vegetable gardens, orchards, a small pond, which was the remains of a clay pit. Uh, clay had been dredged there for the making of bricks in olden times, even as going back as far as the Romans. And of course, a forest of trees surrounding that pond, which C.S. Lewis himself added to cultivated pathways and put in some benches and nice things to enjoy the, the nature and the countryside. Even today, the C.S. Lewis Nature Reserve is preserved a portion of the family's original grounds and it's open to the public. You can walk, you can see this pond, you can walk the same paths that C.S. Lewis originally laid down and see the trees that he planted. C.S. Lewis moved into this house right when he converted to Christianity. Um, depending on your perspective, it was around 1931 or 1930, and um, that was the same time he bought this house and started living here. So all of C.S. Lewis's Christian writings occurred during the time period he lived in this house. The Narnia stories in particular were written primarily while Lewis was using one of the upstairs rooms as a study. Something that strikes people when they visit this place is to realize that C.S. Lewis lived his own life in community with other people. He wasn't a writer in an ivory tower with a blank sheet of paper, but in fact, he was a member of something like a family here with his older brother who had great friendship with him, but also his own struggles in life. And then of course, uh, this woman, Mrs. Moore and her daughter that he took on or took under his wing, if you will. And so the fact that his life was surrounded with the hurly burly of uh, these other people's activities in the midst of which he of course then wrote these amazingly insightful works that have inspired so many tends to really come home when you see the context where he lived. Today, the Kilns is owned by the C.S. Lewis Foundation, which is a donor-supported charity based in California. And they use it both to hold tours for people who want to come and visit and see where C.S. Lewis lived, and secondly, as a place where the scholars and residents who apply to stay here can come and do their studies for either a short stay or some are doing degrees here at Oxford University and come for a year or longer. It was a group of Americans who were visiting who saw that the kilns was for sale and put together a group to purchase it and then led a restoration effort. Uh, not that there aren't people all around the world who love C.S. Lewis, 
but the group that coalesced to do this work was largely based in the United States. C.S. Lewis died on the 22nd of November, 1963, by coincidence the anniversary of Holy Trinity Church's dedication, and his funeral took place at Holy Trinity just four days later. It was a cold and windy day, with flakes of snow in the air. As Lewis had died on the same day as President J.F. Kennedy had been assassinated, the news of his death was delayed in being made public. Consequently, many of his friends and colleagues were unaware of his passing and his funeral. J.R.R. Tolkien was one of only about 30 people at the funeral. Lewis's grave is located in a beautiful section of the churchyard, underneath a large yew tree. And his brother Warren, who died in 1973, is also buried with him. The grave bears a quotation from King Lear. Men must endure, they're going hence. Lewis's mother had a calendar with a Shakespearean quotation for each day of the year, and that was the one on the day she died. Many visitors are surprised by the simplicity of the memorial stone marking the grave. It does not stand out as anything remarkable or grand. And this is exactly what Lewis wanted. He did not particularly enjoy the limelight and wanted to be treated as an ordinary member of the church community. Of course, as Lewis himself writes, there are no ordinary people. This seems especially true of someone with such an extraordinary legacy as Lewis. Pilgrims, inspired by his writings, often visit his grave, leaving flowers and prayers behind as a sign of their affection. As a church, we are currently embarking on a building project which seeks to restore and renew Lewis's church, preserving its rich heritage for future generations and creating new spaces to meet, worship, learn and reach out in friendship to the local community. As well as installing essential up-to-date amenities, we seek to create a heritage and educational area for visitors and pilgrims, a community cafe space for people to meet, and new furnishings to enhance our worship and equip the church to be used for concerts, lectures, and a range of local cultural and artistic activities. Renewing Lewis's church continues his vision of mere Christianity, creating a space for people of all ages and walks of life to discover the riches of the Christian faith, engage their intellect and imagination, and live out their faith in the world. If you have been inspired by this video and would like to learn more about our plans, and how to support us in our fundraising efforts, please do get in touch. You can visit our website for more details. We hope this video tour has given you some insights into our beautiful church building and surroundings, our connection with C.S. Lewis and our restoration plans. We would really appreciate your prayers for our building project and developing our future vision. Our church building is open every day and you're welcome to contact us in advance if you'd like to book a tour guided by members of our church community who have many interesting stories to share about C.S. Lewis. From the village church in the city, the church of C.S. Lewis, we wish you peace and every blessing. <laughs>